Well, everybody's ready. I feel like you're ready before I was. It's 4 o'clock. So excited to have church here at the mission with you guys. It's good to be here. I do want to um, handle like an announcement and a half. Um, yeah. Does anybody remember when our uh, annual church business meeting is happening? I heard it. January 20th at what time? Six o'clock. Six o'clock. There we go. Maybe, I don't know, uh, in, in, including the class. That way we all remember better. I had to, I had to double check too, actually. But that, so that is now our official third announcement. We we're supposed to, in our bylaws, announce it three times beforehand, within a, and we did it. So yay us, we did that. The half of announcement is, guys, we're still having guys night, but there might be, a, we should discuss it a little bit before we go home tonight with the crowd. So just rally together, guys. Let's talk about guys night tonight before we go home. And that's it. Um, let's get into our lesson today. If you would stand with me, we're going to turn in our Bibles to Luke chapter number 2. Luke chapter 2, we're going to read one verse. I know I'm a little late, but Merry Christmas. We kind of did this at our family dinner anyway, but Merry Christmas. I know it's the day after. I think i got to check my calendar again, but I think this is considered in, in uh, some parts across the pond Boxing Day where they, where they package up the stuff that they, uh, they're getting rid of and give it away if it's still good. You know, it's, they put it in a box and they bring it to their neighbors or their friends. Or the, it's Boxing Day. and Today, I'm not about boxing up something old. Today, I, I, I spent time all the way through these holiday preparations studying and praying. This is fresh. This isn't recycled, so this isn't something in a box. This is not Boxing Day sermon, but it's Boxing Day. Luke chapter 2, verse 7. And she brought forth her firstborn son. This is Mary we're talking about. And wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And I'm just going to pray, and hopefully the Lord will help us all do a good job today. Jesus, thank you for this time that we have to open the books, to hear the word, to share in the word, to share in the gifts and the fruit of the Holy Spirit of God. I'm glad, Lord, that you helped us uh, manage the icy conditions and, and all of the holiday hubbub, Lord, that you blessed us, Lord, and you brought us here together to share in the good things of the kingdom of God. I want to ask, Lord, have mercy on us. Look upon us here, Lord, and help us be ready both to, to hear the word at 4 o'clock and to share in the good things in our next service, God. Bless those who are within an earshot of the good news. Let them, Lord Jesus, have the kind of faith, Lord, and the, the kind of courage it takes, Lord, to respond to what you challenge for us in our lives. God bless us here at the mission. Bless our teachers, our elders, our ministers, and our friends, Lord. Bless our families and our loved ones, God, not just with, with good feelings, but God, help us to draw near to you because I know what your word says, that if we draw near to you, Lord, you will draw near to us. Bless us today. God, we want to make room for you today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Bless this, folks. You could be seated. We're going to talk about making room. Make room. Today's lesson uh, is just this one verse, and, and it's kind of sad if you think about it, that last line, because there was no room for them in the end. And what a, what a poignant scene to think about not having room for Jesus not having room for a pregnant mom ready to give birth to a baby, not having room for them. And we hear it, and I hope we could remember it was an example of humility, that God could have chosen any way to show up on this earth. He could have selected for himself, because he is the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He could have selected for himself to be born in a castle, surrounded by wealth and comfort, but he set for us an example of humility. And maybe you could hear that line because there was no room for them in the inn and you could think how selfish it is. How selfish do you have to be to turn away a pregnant lady ready to give birth? How how callous or busy or or just too full of your own issues do you have to be 
There is a reason for all of this, of course, but I want to I want to remind us, maybe point out something that maybe we didn't think of when we read this, when we looked at this, when we're reminded of this every Christmas. They made some room for Jesus. He was born in a manger, and he was laid there wrapped in swaddling cloths. He somebody made some kind of room for Jesus, and you know what? You did too. You ever felt like it's a struggle to make room for Jesus? Just regular. Got to get up. I got to go to work next week. I got to, I got the holiday, you know, I got to wrap this. I got to give that. I got to cook this. I got to do that. I got to go here. Oh, it's, you know, ice is falling out of the sky. It's ruining everything. I, and it's, sometimes it's just hard in all of this to make room for Jesus. Sometimes I could just be so full of my worries, my issues. I could be so busy praying to Jesus about what's going on in my life that I don't have enough time to make room for Jesus actually to be in my life. It's, it's like that. And that's kind of why we're doing this lesson today, because I think sometimes we need to be reminded, Brother Rubinate, you made room for Jesus in your life. There was a day, somehow, some way, somebody brought Jesus to the door of your heart, somehow. They said something, they did something, they invited you to church, they said, hey, you want to do a Bible study, they, they, they just lived a Christian life. Somebody did something in your life, and I got to say, if, if you're anything like me and you're a human being, so you've got, we've got something in common that maybe the room that you had available for Jesus at the beginning wasn't the best room. Maybe it was just the extra room you had in your life. Your life was so full of whatever. My life wasn't perfectly clean when it was time to meet Jesus, and I don't think yours was or is, maybe even right now, that, that when it was time for Jesus to stand at the door of your life and my life, we only had just a manger to offer him. It wasn't the master bedroom. It wasn't a king's palace that we, but we made some kind of room. If you've been born again, if you've, if you've come to a place of repentance or acknowledgement of your need for Christ even, if you're at any step along the road to, to really embracing living for God, then you've made some kind of room for Jesus. But, but maybe it wasn't the best room. And so reading Luke chapter 2 and verse 7, we could go, oh, what a bunch of jerks. They didn't have room for Mary and baby Jesus. Well, somebody made some kind of room for Jesus. And I think that's the part of the Christmas story I want to remind you. And I want to encourage you maybe. I want to maybe motivate somebody to think about it. See, the message isn't just that you did make some kind of room for Jesus, but that we should continue. Whatever space is available, make room for Jesus. Let's just make room for the Lord. And we could stand there and we could wring our hands thinking about how I didn't make a ton of space for Jesus in my life. I was too busy this, or I, or I really blew it and did that, or, or, you know, I'm not as godly and awesome as Sister Griggs, and so, like, I can't make the kind of room for Jesus that she'd... We should stop talking and we should stop thinking like that and just be willing to make whatever room there is, let's just make room for Jesus. That's how he started the story for us. There was no room, but yet somebody found some kind kind of room that Jesus could be born. You know what? You made some room for God to be born in you if you have been born again of the water and the spirit. You said, God, I'm not going to do it my way. I'm going to do it your way. And whatever space there was, it was enough room for Christ to get into your heart and into your spirit and to transform your life. Maybe we got to just start having a mission and a vision in our lives all over again as we head out of this year and into the next one, we're just going to make room for Jesus. And I'm going to look at you and I'm going to look at whatever life you've got going on, whether it's a hot mess or a pretty mess, and I'm going to look at it and I'm going to say, we can still, there's room there for Jesus. There's room in your life for Jesus. There was room in mine. So please remember, let's make room for Jesus. Let's find a room for Jesus to work in someone else's life. That's the lesson today. You can go home. Just kidding. I'm going to actually teach. You know, what if the innkeeper in the story knew what he had? You know, we've told the story. There's been skits and plays for a couple thousand years about this. And we go, man, what an innkeeper. He turned away a pregnant lady. What a jerk. Did Mary and Joseph stand there and go, hey, you know, this is the guy. His name will be called Jesus. Heaven told me this. He's going to save his people from their sins. He's going to be the king, the Messiah. This is Jesus. You can't turn Jesus away. 
And, and you'd wonder, well, maybe that's why they at least found a room in the barn or whatever it was for him. Maybe that's why. Maybe mom and dad were standing there going, you don't know who you're not making room for here. Let me tell you what this is. This isn't just me having labor pains. This isn't just me breaking water here. This is, there is some, you know, this is a big deal. This means something for you. Don't turn away Jesus when he stands at the door and he knocks. He said, I stand. In Revelation, he said, I stand at the door and I knock. And if anybody will open the door, I will come in. I will come in. That's the story of the gospel message. That's the story of Jesus. That's a Christmas story, if ever I heard one. Is Jesus at the door. And if you know what's standing at your door, you will open the door. If you really could appreciate what it means to have the Lord trying to find a room in your heart, you will open that door. I don't have to convince you. I don't have to persuade you. I don't have to upsell or downsell. I don't have to bribe you or motivate you. If you really could understand, if you could really look and see what this Jesus really can mean for you, you'll open that door. There will be room for Jesus in, your, in their life. It's so common at Christmas time, at New Year's time to look back. It's so common to remember folks that aren't here, choices that you made that you wish you could unmake. It's so common to look back. And we could look back on this scene and go, well, what if they'd found a better room for Jesus? That would have changed the whole Christmas story. But what if I told you maybe there was no innkeeper? What if I told you that there was no inn? This is why we do word study, ministers and teachers. We... Looked up the word, by we I mean me, in, and in just means guest room. There was no room for them in the guest room. Now, I don't know, some of you might be blessed enough to have a guest room in your home. That doesn't make yours an in. I know nowadays you could do Airbnb and you can like, you know, people can sleep in a tent in your yard and pay you rent for that. It's amazing. I'm missing out on something. I need to get me a yard. But it was just, really, if you just use word study, if you just take out your Strong's Concordance, if you just study the Bible, you'll see that maybe we've been getting part of the Christmas story wrong all this time, that it wasn't an inn. And if, if I could give you a little history, I could, I could show you that, you know, Joseph and Mary, when it was about that time, they had to go to Bethlehem in Judea because there was a census, right? And it says, while they were there it came to be time for her to give birth to this baby. So that's, that tells me, A, that all the family of Joseph was in Bethlehem of Judea, which would kind of hint, it's not written out explicitly, it would kind of clue me in that Joseph then is probably staying at some family member, some relative of some ancestor who still lives in Bethlehem of Judea. They're probably staying in somebody's home. And that is why there was no room for them in the guest room because the house was probably full. If all of the descendants, if all of the cousins and second cousins and aunts and uncles and grandbabies were all coming into town for the census, they were probably stacking them in the guest room like cordwood. And so when I read the story that there was no room for them in the guest room, well, I'm kind of glad that they had room in the manger for Jesus to be born because who wants to hang out with the cousins? and the uncles and the aunts while you're pushing and you're breathing and you're going through all the Lamaze stuff and Joe is sitting there panicking and doesn't know what to do with himself and they didn't have clean stuff like they did do today back then so the guest room being full of all of the extended family was probably not the most private place for Jesus to be born it doesn't change the Christmas story it was still a crowded scene it was still, this is the best we've got, Jesus. I hope it's enough. I hope it's enough. Guess what? Whatever room you've got in your life is enough for Jesus to work with. That's the story today. You see, it was typical in the Judean house of that day that they had an area either near the door or sometimes they had like a cave in the back, which is interesting. Um, that's, they would bring their animals in after dark so that robbers and people who steal Amazon packages off of porches wouldn't come and take their sheep and their goats and their cattle and their chickens and whatever else they might have had. They probably didn't have chickens. I don't know. I can't remember if chickens are clean or unclean in the Bible. Um, but they would bring their animals in at night so they wouldn't get stolen. 
And so we, we picture Jesus being born in a feeding trough in a barn way out back or whatever. You know what? They actually had their animals close by so they wouldn't lose them. And so it's not the best room of the house, but it isn't the worst situation altogether. And see, so, you know, God's not slumming it when he's coming into your life. God's not necessary, necessarily settling. But, you know, if you let him into your life the way he really wants to get in there, he'll turn that manger space into something special. He'll turn whatever corner of your heart and whatever corner of your life that you want to give to him, he'll turn that into a palace. It's a, it's, the Bible says he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High will abide under the shadow of the Almighty. You know, we create for him a secret place in our hearts. That's, that's why it's so important, folks, that we do pray daily. Why we read this book, we create in our hearts this clean and wondrous place where we can sit down with Jesus and we can hear from him and we can talk with him. And that's why I, when I quoted for you what he said in Revelation, that he stands at the door and he knocks, he's telling us that if we'll open the door, it's, he literally said, I'll come in and I'll dine with you and you will dine with me. It's like sitting down at the table with your Lord and having a time with him that's just yours, the most private and the most special encounter with the guy who made everything, the heavens and the earth and everything in between, the things you could see and feel and touch and things beyond your imagination, the one who made all of that wants to come and sit in the secret place in your heart and in your life and he wants to dine with you. Make room for Jesus and don't worry if it's not the best space. If you open the door, he said he will come in and he's not going to judge you for the drapes. He's going to sit down and over time you'll find that things shift around and the furniture gets moved and the decor changes. The stuff inside your heart gets better because Jesus is in there. That's, that's what you need to do. I've heard before, and I'll probably hear it again. Well, I just got to get a few ducks in a row and then I'll join you. Then I'll come with you and I'll have church like you have church. Then I'll come and I'll have Bible study or then I'll come and pray. at the. Don't worry about getting your ducks in a row. Make room. Whatever room there is, make room for Jesus. He'll be born there. He'll sit down there with you, and he will do something special that only he can do. Make room. Make room. Jesus said, because you say I'm rich, I have become wealthy. I have need of nothing, and do not know that, that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus said, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, and the shame the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see as many as I love, I rebuke. Sometimes having him come into the house means dad's going to tell you you're not doing everything all right. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. Behold, I've been telling you this, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. When did you first notice your need for the Lord? What was the knock on your door? What had you finally saying, I'll make whatever room I can? Was it something somebody said? Was it something somebody did? Well, then how about find a way to do exactly that for somebody else? I don't know what to do, Pastor. I don't, know, I don't know how to reach my world. Do whatever it was that had you first hearing the knock of the Lord at the door of your heart. Do that. He gave you that example at the very least. Cheat sheet almost. You're going to get through this test just fine. Just do whatever made that sound in your heart. You see, Jesus' story isn't one of comfort and ease, though. And that's why he, when he decided to show up, he, he showed up in a scene that said, because there was no room for them in the guest room. And then later he says, foxes of the ground, they have dens. Birds of the air, they have nests. But the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. He said that to the disciples that he was calling to follow him. That's when he said those words. And he was trying to tell them, Sometimes it's going to seem like there's no room for you. If you want to follow me, sometimes it's going to look like everybody's too busy. 
their homes are too full, their schedules are too full, their entertainment has filled their mind too much, their, their friendships have got their attention too captivated. Sometimes it's going to seem like nobody's got any room whatsoever. That's what it's like, Jesus was trying to tell the disciples. That's what he's trying to tell us. Sometimes to be a Christian, sometimes to follow the Lord means there's no room, or at least you feel like that. But all he needs is just that one little corner. All he needs is for one person to hear the knocking at the door when he's knocking at their heart. We've just got to keep showing up. We've just got to keep doing the right things the right way. We've just got to be consistently God-fearing people. That's it. We've just got to live like we're supposed to live. And, and, and I'm oversimplifying it, but it's just a few things. Just love Jesus and make room for him in your life. Consistently, continually, he'll do all the work. He'll make all the noise. He'll do all the changing. And when the world around you is so crowded and it seems like there's no room for you, you're in good company because there was no place for Jesus. But I want to give you the good news. The same guy who said to those disciples that there's nowhere for me to lay my head, every time he needed a spot to sit down for dinner, there seemed to be a place to go for dinner. Every time he needed a car ride, there seemed to be a car that showed up. I'm modernizing the Bible. Whenever he needed wheels, they showed up. He'd send his disciples, you go in there and you tell them that Jesus is coming and suddenly the dinner's laid out and there's even people sometimes available to wash the feet of everybody there. Jesus never had want of anything, even though he was trying to tell us there's no room for me in this world. Everywhere he went, all his needs were provided, and that's what he's saying to the church continually. Just follow him. Just continue to make room for Jesus and find a way to make a room in someone else's life for Jesus, and it's going to work out just fine. You will always be provided for. He will take care of it. He will make the way. He's going to do all of the heavy lifting. Jesus, he went through life like he had no room, but he's the only person I've ever heard of, seen, or met that managed to find 12 best friends, well, 11 anyway, who were willing to leave everything and die for him. I don't know if I got any friends that will lay it down like that for me. Maybe one or two. I believe you all love me truly and better than most people, even in my own flesh and blood family. But I got to tell you, Jesus is the only one I know that had people that loyal to him. They left everything, and they went with him wherever he went. And they went without packing lunch. They went without their jacket and their backpack. They, went with, they trusted him explicitly and implicitly. If he said do it, they gave it a shot. They went with him everywhere. And even after he was gone, they had to learn it a little bit, but they found a way to remember their loyalty and their friendship. Jesus said, you aren't my servants, you are my friends. The man who had no room for him had the most full life, as short as it was, of anybody I know, because he was willing to make room in other people's lives, because he wasn't worried about filling his life with things, with stuff, and being too busy. He went out there, and he gave it all, and he had more, so much more. I don't have 12 best friends that die for me. I mean, maybe, but not like that. Jesus, he got that, and he wants us to get that. So get a room. There was a certain Samaritan as he journeyed. He actually did go to an inn, not a guest room. He saw a man laying in the road naked and beaten. And when he saw him, he had compassion. And he went to him. He bandaged his wounds. He poured in oil and wine. And he s sat this guy on his own animal and brought him to an inn. It's a different word in the concordance. This one means public house. It means an inn. And he took care of it. This guy had a different kind of room, had a different kind of inn, made room for someone else. He paid for the room. He paid for his medicine. And he said to the innkeeper, this is a real innkeeper, not a supposed one. And he said to him, look, if you rack up any more than what I've left with you, you let me know and I'll pay the bill. He used what resources he had available to care for someone else. Jesus said, oh, good job, servant. Come into the rest and to the joy of the Lord. Because when I was naked, you clothed me. When I was hungry, you fed me. 
When I was sick, you took care of me. When I was in prison, you visited me. Lord, when did we do that? If you did it for one of the least of these, you did it for me. So when I say make room for Jesus, maybe I'm also saying make room for Jesus by making room for someone else. You make room for Jesus when you get a room. Be the good Samaritan. Oh, but I don't have a lot of money. Same rule applies as I started this lesson. Whatever room you've got is good enough for Jesus. He just needs a little corner to lay in. He just needs to be at the door of their heart knocking. Whatever you've got is good enough. Whatever resources, whatever time, whatever, whatever you can do, that is enough. Oh, I can't, you know, I can't speak like Brother Russell. I can't play music like Sister, you know, Sarah Bodwin can. I can't, I can't do the things that Pastor does. No, but whatever you've got is enough. You've got enough. You can get a room for somebody, so to speak. I'm being, this is a metaphor for us taking time, making space, whatever we can do. we got to recognize that most of, these, most of these meetings in our life, most of these opportunities in our life are an open door, or they could be. It's, if it's a closed door, Jesus is standing at it, knocking on it, waiting for them to open it. Whatever you have available, use that to make room. Get a room for somebody. Get a room. We make room for Jesus when we get a room for somebody in need. Maybe it's the poet in me, but it's interesting that Jesus wasn't worried about having a room at the end when he came. But he praised the Good Samaritan for finding a room for somebody else. Jesus came to his disciples and said, I've got nowhere to lay my head. But he said this. In another place in scripture, he said, in my father's house are many mansions, which means rooms when you do word study. I've gone, or I go, looking back, he has gone, I go to prepare a place for you. The one who had no room for himself, his whole mission was to make a room for you in heaven. I go to prepare a place for you. For you. What an example. I know Christmas is behind us, but the Christmas message never stops. It never ends. And part of this message should be, let's make a room. Let's make room in our hearts. Let's find a way to prepare a place for our neighbor next to us in heaven. We make room when we make room for others. Make time. One of the most valuable things we have that we get for free is time. Harvey McKay said that. He said, time is free, but it's priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. Once you've lost it, you can never. That's right. The Bible actually says pretty much the same thing. See then that you walk circumspectly. Not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. I don't have enough time for that. Well, you, got, you guys at this church, you're driving me nuts. You keep talking about witnessing. You keep, you know, pumping Bible study. You keep talking about God's word for life and how you can go home for 10 minutes. How do I find 10 minutes a day to read this devotion with myself or my family? 10 minutes. I don't have 10 minutes. Like, whoa. Time is the one thing worth the most that you can squander and fritter away doing frivolous and wasteful things. And it's the most precious thing you've got. And the trick is, is you don't know how much is available to you. There's an expiration on it and nobody came along and told you when your time runs out. You know it will, but you don't know when. All you've got is time, but you could take that time and make room for Jesus. Make some time. Find a way to, oh, I don't have time. I don't have resources. One of, one of the elders of this church who's moved on to another church, years gone by, he once told me, if it's important to you, you will find the money to pay for it. And I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. I, back in those days, I was making minimum wage, driving 300,000 miles just to come to church in a car that 400, had 400 million miles on it. You don't know what you're talking about. And he did know what he was talking about. He, he wasn't going to let me off the hook. If it's important, he said, you will make a way. If it's important, you will make the money so that you can find a way to have that thing or to do that thing or to take that trip or to get that car or to buy that 
home or whatever the case may be. If it's important, you will find a way to pony up the thousands of dollars in orthodontia bills just so your kids can have a nice smile. If it's important, you will find a way. You will make a way. Well, guess what's important? Making room for Jesus. You can make room. You can. You just got to stop letting yourself off the hook and stop making excuses. You got time enough to reach a soul that needs Jesus. You've got the time if you will make the time. I'm too busy to be a minister. I'm too busy to be a teacher. I'm too busy to be a leader. I'm too busy to, to really turn around my relationship with my family. No, you. if it's important enough, you will make the time. It's a hard thing for me to say to the church today, to my friends and loved ones, but if Jesus is important, you will make room for him. The problem isn't time. You've got time. You've got the same amount that everybody else does. You have the same number of hours, minutes, and days as your pastor does until you're both in the grave. You've got the same time. You can and you ought to. You must make room for Jesus. Time is just moving on by. And so when he said it in Ephesians chapter 5 that you should walk circumspectly, that you should redeem the time, he's warning us, church. He's warning us that time is slipping away. Stop. Stop wasting time and start making time for Jesus. Man, I was trying to teach a lesson and not preach at you today, but here you go. Make time. Make room. We can if it's important enough. We can. And we ought to. At the end of this lesson, I, I want to talk about a guy. I don't think he's very godly. His name was Jack London. Some of you might, the name, like, well, wait a minute, Jack London. He was uh, basically, in America, one of the first famous celebrity writers, basically. This guy was like the guy's guy, apparently. He, he, like, he went to the Yukon. He went to Southeast Asia back like, during the time of Spanish flu and all of that. Like, this guy went all over. To, he went to the Arctic. He, he went and visited you know, tribes of cannibals in the jungles and whatnot. Like, this guy did all that stuff. He did lots of stuff. And it, it was said, somebody was trying to do a biography on this guy, that they said he was a dreamer and a visionary, and his dreams and visions almost always outran his finances. They were saying that this guy, he had to publish. He wrote a lot. He wrote magazine articles. He, did, he wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote and wrote. It, it said that he wrote 1,000 words a day and almost never did revisions. He just kept writing. 1,000 words a day. This guy, Jack London, died before he reached my age, living the life that he lived, right? And it's said of him, this dreamer, this visionary, this guy who traveled and did amazing things, this guy that he, he just, he had to live it. He had to go and see it. He had to go and do it. And he didn't have the money to do it. That's why he wrote so much. He was broke all the time. And so if I better publish because I can't pay the bills. I better publish because I can't afford the boat trip. I better publish because I got to eat and I need a new pair of boots if I'm going to go on that hike again. He had to just keep writing. He was constantly broke and he constantly spent it. And he kept going and going and going. And he died early while he was doing it. But this is what he said when somebody asked him about his lifestyle. He said, I would rather be ashes than dust. The proper function of a man is to live not to exist. I shall not waste my days trying to prolong them. I shall use my time. Like I said, I don't think he was a very godly man, but some people, I was talking about this guy with my pastor, and he said some people live more in a week than a lot of us do. Is it a year? Lifetime, maybe. This guy lived, but that was his mission. Do you feel like you're living for Jesus? Do you feel like you're living for Jesus? I don't always, but man, I want to be captured by that kind of vision. I want to somehow find a way. I'm going to get in prayer. I'm going to get hungry. I'm going to get curious. I'm going to get after the Lord, and I'm going to find a way to capture some of that. I want to live this life, and if it costs me something, if by making room in someone else's life, that they could have Jesus, if that costs me that I can't do that thing or have that thing, then maybe at least I'll still know I've lived. I think I agree with Jack. I would rather be ashes than dust. I'd rather have a church that's so on fire for the Lord that some of us risk being burned out doing it than be a church that's just dead. 
and not really living to the potential that it could be. So today, this lesson, this sermon is about making room. I'm just going to pray in closing, and I want to ask you guys, really pray about this. And pray, you know, if, you, if you're here for service number two at five, let's make room for Jesus. Who knows what he's going to do while we sing, while we praise him. You don't, I mean, I've seen people just receive the Holy Spirit during song service before we could even get to the part where they're supposed to get the Holy Spirit. I've seen healings. I prayed for a guy in the chairs right over there one year, and I just laid a hand on his shoulder because that's what you do. You sneak up behind them, and you lay a hand on them because you don't want them to know you're praying for them. And he's, later I was next to him, and he said, I don't know who did that. They laid their hand on my shoulder. I was healed. I wasn't praying for healing. I was trying to sneak a Jesus prayer on this guy, and he got a healing in his shoulder. He said, my shoulder's been bothering me for 20 years, and it's fine. Like, you don't know if you just make room for Jesus. I didn't, I didn't have, like big faith that said, let's heal a guy. I just did what I do. I just prayed. You don't know what will happen if you'll just go ahead tonight and make room for Jesus. I'm going to pray before I get carried away again. Jesus, we want to make room for you in our lives. We want to make room for you in church. We want to make room for you in our homes. I believe it, not just because, Lord, I'm excited, but God, I know this people. This is a people who loves you, Lord, who wants to know you, who wants to love you better. Jesus, I pray today that God, this wonderful, powerful, amazing people of God, this mighty group of people right here, God, and anybody else who might be in earshot of these lessons and sermons. God, that God, you'd bless us as we make room for you tonight. God, we want to make room for you in service. We want to make room for you in our ministries, God. We want you to have whatever space is available, God. It may not be the best, and it may not be the classiest, but God, I believe today, it was in your word that if I will open the door, if I will open the door while you stand there and knock, that you will come in. Oh, Lord, help us to have the kind of faith and courage that says we're going to live, and we're going to open a door for you to come on in. We're going to make room for somebody else to taste this life, God, and that more abundantly. Oh, Lord, bless us at the mission today. Bless us today in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 Let's take a little break before our second service, and why don't you greet somebody and make a little room for Jesus in their life.